Hi, everyone. We'll just give people a couple of minutes to connect in. In fact, probably not a couple of minutes, a few seconds. Okay, I think um, I'm going I'm to kick off. Um, thank you all very much for uh, for joining us here um, today. We did have a plan of um, um, us as meeting sort of in a room, which uh, you know, put, but Paul's the only only person who's actually managed to make it into our meeting room, which is my fault because I tested positive for COVID. So it would have been slightly different, but hopefully we can um, we can sort of get through um, and do something very similarly to what we had planned. Um, for those of you who don't know, this year is ILC's 23rd, 25th um, anniversary, and what we really wanted to do as part of that was to get together a group of friends um, ahead of our Future of Aging conference to talk a bit about what's changed in terms of public policy on aging, what hasn't changed, and, and what do we need to do for the future. It's a really, really informal session. Um, please, please do keep yourself on mute. Leave your camera on. We'd like to see you. Um, 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 my colleague will be running around muting people if there's some background noise of people building and things like that, but please do do that. If you've got questions or comments, raise your electronic hand um, and make sure your, your um, camera is on because that will push you to the front of my screen. Um, but equally, if you want to contribute, there's some, you know, post a question in the chat and hopefully I will see that. And I'm going to bring in my my colleagues um, throughout um, after they've done their intro. So we have Caroline Abrahams of Age UK, Jackie Wells, um, ILC advisor who we've worked with for many years, Mario Ambrosi from Anchor, who is um, one of the ILC partners. Um, Emily Holshausen from Carers UK, uh, Kate Jopling, freelance consultant and formerly of ILC, and Paul. And I should say there's two people whose fault it is that I'm here today. One of which is um, is, is Sally Greengross. Um, you know, it was it, you know if it wasn't for Sally, I wouldn't be here today. And the other is Paul. Um, in the, about almost 20 years ago now, I think Paul. Um, um, in, interviewed me for a job at Help the Aged, and um, and if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here. So, so you know, it's all your fault, Paul. Um, um, uh, for those of you who don't know as well, there's a few of us here where, and this is part of the motivation as well, Caroline, Mar Mario and Emily, who were involved in an initiative we had sort of five or six years ago that we called the Ready for Aging Alliance. And in, in, in some ways, this is the sort of, you know, a group of people who we'd have today if we were doing it. And it was a group of people who were sort of looking at what we do as a society, following our, on from Lord Filkin's report to actually help us adapt a little bit more to, to this space. And clearly, there's been a huge amount that changed over you know uh, over over the past sort of 25 years and uh, um and i think the big bit of the debate we want today is well what what ha what do we need to do now you know but but actually life expectancy at birth has increased from 66 to 73 across the world um and uh, the proportion of those aged over 65 has increased by 50 percent so you've seen huge changes in life expectancy even over 25 years but actually on the policy side much less movement if you look back to 2000 we had um um sally uh, was and I, I wanted to mention this sally was involved and many of you will remember this in this huge debate of the age where they had hundreds of conversations all over the uk launched a report at the millennium called the millennium debate um, um at, I think with Tony Blair and actually up until a couple of weeks ago Sally was still working on uh, a follow-up to that and and it's something we'd still like to continue to push forward but one of the really interesting things about you know having looked at the reports from 2000 is actually how little has actually changed you know how met how much some of the issues are the same issues that were raised back in 2000 I think there's a interesting sort of starting point there for us of course soon after that we did have 
two older people's strategies. We had a team in the DWP who were interested. We had an older people's housing strategy actually launched by, you know, you think about now having a, a, a housing strategy just for older people that was launched by, you know, the Deputy Prime Minister, by Gordon Brown at the time, by the, um, I think when he was PM. So, so you saw huge political leadership in this space. And we had the Social Exclusion Unit doing huge amounts of work in this space. And, uh, um, and, and clearly, you know, there's been some progress. State pension is more, much more generous than it was 20 years ago. Millions of people have been auto-enrolled into private pensions. Age discrimination legislation has been introduced. And you've got Kate here, who's very, very involved in the, the last, in the, some of the age discrimination legislation that went through Parliament. Um, retirement ages are a thing of the past for most of us. Care has attracted growing political and policy attention. And actually, at the global level, the, you know, and you think this is, really striking more than a billion people have lifted themselves out of extreme poverty and so you've seen huge huge changes from that point of view but you know and we like to be a bit miserable but the the reality is you know i think from my point of view it's there's a lot more glass half full you know inequalities in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy have grown yes we're working longer longer lives but 50 to 64 year olds still less likely to be in employment than 25 to 49 year olds and we're not making any anywhere near the sort of you know in fact actually uh, in terms of those aged over 65 we're not a lot further ahead than we were in the 1960s in terms of the proportion of people who were working at that age um we're not building enough homes the public sector's built you know almost nothing the private sector hasn't been able to fill the gap um and of course it was 25 years ago the labor manifesto committed to establish a royal commission on care you know and since then you know clearly we've not made the sort of progress we, we need to um and then finally sort of you know actually coming on to the global side well on the one hand climate change change and antimicrobial resistance threatens the progress we've made but actually you know it's still the case despite that positive um you know fact in terms of the in terms of the pulling people out of poverty but almost 60 million children in primary school age aren't in school and 20 percent of older people in low-income countries receive a pension so there is still huge amounts to be done in the uk and i think fundamentally for me actually the the thing that really hasn't changed is we just aren't whether that be in the uk or abroad really adapting our society to to more older people so now and i'm going to stop now and ask my colleagues to either agree or disagree or go into yeah and and, and hopefully we can have a bit of a, a conversation conversation about all of those issues and beyond because as I say I'm really lucky that we have got such experts in the room um I say please put your comments in the chat and I'm going to kick off by asking Caroline to say a few words from Age UK okay thank you very much David I'm really sorry not to be with everybody in person today and I'm sorry you've got COVID and I hope hope you're not you, do, you sound remarkably cogent for somebody with uh, with a virus like COVID so you're obviously doing all right at the moment and I also just wanted to acknowledge too obviously this is the first event I've attended with ILC since Sally's death and I'm I obviously you know we're, she's very much in our thoughts I think at the moment and I think she'd have enjoyed this afternoon and thought it was a lot of fun so I'm sure let's kind of let's meet in with that spirit in mind um I wanted to kind of just say a few things uh really on the back of what where you ended David so I was thinking about this in terms of what's happened in the last five years six years since we last used to have those ready for aging meetings which are quite good fun um, and think about it from a UK perspective and probably quite a public sector perspective as well um, and so my contention I think would be that actually we've gone backwards in the last five years I certainly don't think we've gone forward in those respects I think there's a whole set of reasons for that. One of them clearly is the pandemic, which has been a, you know, a huge distraction to say the least, but has very much dominant, taken all the oxygen out of lots of public debate over the last couple of years. And we're not out of the woods yet, as David shows us. Um, but also perhaps because we've got a government which is particularly short term, unusually short term, you know, even, even with lots of administrations that tend to only think short term, this lot take the biscuit, I think they really are. Uh, very short term in their thinking. They're very populist um, and they're very distracted as well by all sorts of other things. So, you know, I, and even when they do issue something that sounds like a plan or strategy, it doesn't really seem to stick very well. So just thinking about levelling up, for example, which seems to have that came with a bit of a hurrah, but I'm not sure what's coming on the back of it. Uh, you know, so I, and of course, the fact that, you know, 
public money is tight and has been, and they've they've been committed to, um, or have been trying to commit to not spending very much public money. Although obviously have had to spend a huge amount during the pandemic. None of these things have helped. So I think that's part of what's going on. And I was thinking, you know, it's quite hard to point to areas of dis distinct progress. I think as regards. Um, readiness for ageing uh, and being prepared to adapt our society in this country. And I was thinking, for example, of things like the uh, midlife career reviews, which were piloted a few years ago and I think found to be quite successful. Um, and of course, they do still happen, I think, um, but not for very many people. And I think so I'm sure that they, that might be a bit emblematic of the fact that there is some good practice out there, but it's not really taken root and affected you know, being something that everyone can benefit from. Um, that, that would just be my thought about that. And on health, I think we've be begun to see a, a slightly more thoughtful response to ageing. Um, you know, we've had the ageing world strategy, which is part of the long term plan. But, you know, as ever, it's been that the progress on that's being undermined by shortages, shortages of resources, partly of people, also of money. Um, and arguably perhaps a lack of leadership uh, within the NHS on older people per se, which is not me being rude about the people who are charged with doing that, but they've got lots of other things to do and as well on the whole, they're rarely there just for older people or for ageing. Um, I guess the more positive thing is there's more interest at the moment in people with multiple long-term conditions who actually tend to be older, but not necessarily very old, but, you know, may well be. Those, those things often start to become really apparent for people in their 50s. So people in their 50s and 60s, the, the, the penny is dropping, I think, in the NHS. that actually people in, uh, with lots of things going on for them, whether that's arthritis or heart disease or whatever, diabetes, uh, mental health problems, uh, when you've got a cluster of those issues, they, they're people who need to, a lot of resources from the NHS. And uh, therefore, if you can start to do something, helpful for those people. You're going to save uh, save them some years, hopefully, and save the NHS quite a lot of money. That's been quite helpful, but it, we're only that's just being discussed. It's not really taken hold yet, I don't think, in terms of driving resource. Um, of course, we've just had the census, haven't we? And we've had the new stats around the numbers of older people. And again, the media debate on that was quite interesting. I mean, we at AGK said something quite positive about it. What a surprise. Um, I think generally, there was, I would have said, though, the general atmosphere around that finding was, oh, no, we've got more older people than younger people or whatever. I think, you know, it, 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 we've still got quite a long way to go, I think, in terms of the sort of public attitude around uh, towards all of this. It was interesting, too, though, to see the debate that is underway, I think, amongst policymakers trying to understand what's happened to uh, labour market trends in, in over the last year or so with apparently significant numbers of in their 50s and 60s leaving the labour market and the research that's come out so far does not find an economic reason for that by which I mean that people are voting with their feet and appear to be getting out and we don't really know why at the moment and there's much more to learn about that but I think it'd be fair to say that that group of people in the run-up to retirement are one of the groups we worry about the most in age UK because you know it's it's no fun being 63 and a few years away from your state pension and not being able to work and having to rely on very small savings if you're lucky and a universal credit regime that was never designed for you and you know that's really tough and obviously we've heard a lot about women in that situation a lot of those are the so-called waspy women but of course it's many men as well men who maybe you know were in manual jobs during their lives and just can't keep working so we're not really meeting the needs of that group and, and as I say we really worry about them at AGK it's, it's a pretty miserable existence I think and it, it's interesting that we're now at a stage aren't we in a, our society where the people like that it, the relief is getting to the state pension age you know in the past in a way this is a sort of roundabout way of talking about what David was talking about the fact that state pension age state pension's gone up so you know people are less poor on state pension if, particularly if they claim their benefits than they, they were in the past uh, but that means that if you're not quite there and if you're on a really low income, uh, life is really, really tough. Uh, and of course, you've got the state pension age review coming up next year. It will be interesting to see uh, the debate around all of that. I think uh, that'd be very important. One of the things we talked about a lot when we met as the um, Ready for Aging Alliance, as I'm sure my colleagues remember, was the whole intergenerational stuff. And we were quite worried, I think, at that point. It seemed to be getting a lot of traction in a way that was 
you know, I mean, what we weren't wishing to do down in any way the uh, interests and needs of younger people, far from it. But we were worried about one group being pitched against another. And, you know, the rather unpleasant things that were being said about young people and about older people. So thinking about where that is now, I think it, arguably it's a little bit less of it than there was, um, I think. Um, but it's still the kind of go-to topic for the lazy columnist on a Friday afternoon who's got to submit 800 words by the next day and desperate to fill those column inches. So I, we still do see some pretty, frankly, crappy journalism about it. Um, and, you know, young people have got lots to worry about. There's no doubt about that. And we've seen during the cost of living uh, crisis uh, and the debate about that, obviously, some people making the point and uh, the papers picking it up too. Well, is it fair really to be giving older people more when uh, younger people with peak workers aren't getting wage rises and all of that? But it hasn't got, I would have said, worse than it was. And I think there's been less talk too now about boomers. There was a lot of talk about boomers a few years ago. Of course, we still hear about boomers. Um, I, I'm a boomer, so maybe I'm just filtering it out. Who knows? But it kind of feels to me as though there's a bit less around that. Um, and I think the Brexit effect has started to wane as it, over this debate, as, of course, it has probably about pretty much everything else as well. But it hasn't entirely gone away. And then finally, I was just going to say a word about the science of ageing and the whole kind of shtick around all of that. And there was, there's a, there was a lot of noise about that a few years ago. I think there still is some. And there are still international conferences and all the rest of it, as there are on everything. But again, I think that hasn't hasn't become more prominent. Of course, everybody's still very keen to think about what they can do to postpone getting old if they possibly can, um, which is a pretty tough thing to do, I think. Um, but and, and an interest in commercialising and making money out of that, that, you know, probably entirely natural human desire. But again, hasn't got particularly worse that I've noticed. Um, so, yeah, really, David, I'm agreeing with you. I think much, much is the same. But if anything, on the on the public policy front, if anything, we've gone backwards. But then one might say that about quite a lot of things at the moment. I'll, I'll... <laughs> great, you. great. Thank, thanks, Caroline. We'll come back to you later. I think there's a, interestingly the report we one of the two reports we did with the Ready for Aging Alliance, um, um, which was on the boomers, actually, is still the one of the most downloaded reports on the ILC website. And actually, we absolutely came from it from point of view, as you say, of not pitching young against old. But sort of, I remember us highlighting a few fun things like um, people in their fifties and sixties no more likely to be planning a cruise than younger people, and you know, actually, of course more seriously that you know um you know the huge number of um older people who just never went to, did a degree you know actually never went into further education um and higher education um so let me um rather than ramble just pass over to um jackie wells who's going to talk um um a little bit about sort of you know pensions and money and where we've got to and where we should be going to um in that space so jackie Thanks, David. Um, I guess I'm going to start by saying something slightly different to, to yourself and Caroline in that I think a massive amount has changed in, in pensions over the last 25 years. I mean, if we pan back to kind of the, uh, the 90s, we were in the sort of peak of mis-selling and people being sold very expensive personal pensions and being pushed out of their um uh public sector schemes and so on and 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 most of the change i think we've seen in in certainly the last 10 years has been generally good um some of it's less good um so i i, I could probably speak for hours on on what's changed but i've i've kind of pulled out maybe three or four major things i mean the big thing of course is 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 auto enrollment which has which has made it easy for people to save um, and I think that's a big headline um, it's drawn in millions of people into pensions and and um, it's not just drawn them in but it's given them bigger better value and better um, run schemes to join and um, and the whole premise of auto enrollment based around a workplace scheme and large workplace schemes I think has has on the whole, been pretty effective. Um, of course, alongside that, we've seen the massive decline in, in, in DB schemes, though, in the private sector. 
but uh, not so much in the public sector, although the public sector DV offering has obviously been diluted somewhat, but we see massive inequalities between those in the public and the private sector, which I think is something that, that's going to come back uh, as, as a debate. Um, I did some work recently on, uh, <laughs> on the fascinating subject of pensions taxation and, and some of the modelling we did for that with PPI um, suggested that a, 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 simil, a, a person working in the private sector on relatively low pay and someone on the same pay in the public sector, the public sector person will get 10 times the pension income in retirement than the person in the private sector with a DC um, default auto enrollment scheme. So massive inequalities there. Um, second thing, I mean, you both mentioned the, the state pension and, and we've seen massive change there. And, and I absolutely agree that uh, one of the big worries is that group of people who are in their 60s and uh, coming up to retirement, not able to work and so on. And that's a group that has to be uh, looked at uh, in, in, in a lot of detail. And it's very, it's very difficult for people if they particularly if they've built up savings for retirement um, and then end up having to use them in, in, in the years leading up to their, their state pension because they don't get any benefits otherwise. Um, but I think the, the big change for me on state pensions is, is that it's become a lot easier to understand. Um, it's much easier to understand what you're going to get. It's easier, I think, to uh, accrue rights to your state pension than it was certainly um, when I started work. Um, and, and that simplicity is partly because we've removed this complexity of the means testing, um, which was necessary for, for the auto enrollment. Um, third big change uh, that we've seen in pensions is, is it was introduced by the pension freedoms for DC pensions. So the way in which people can take their pension now um, has, has massively changed. Some of that is good, some of that's less good. Um, it's introduced massive complexity for people. Uh, they have to work out how to manage their, their money in retirement much more um, intricately. They have to think about how long they're going to live. They have to fight against the inevitable tendency to want to draw a lot of it down early in retirement and, and spend it. Um, so, so the pension freedoms have transformed people's options. And I think, you know, not having to buy an annuity at age 65 or whatever is, is undoubtedly a good thing for some people. Um, but I think we've possibly moved, moved too far away from that. And I think we, if you ally that with the changes that have taken place in advice, financial advice, where it's largely outside of the... Uh, 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 of the ac accessibility to most people now because of the, the cost or the perceived cost. Um, I think there's, there, there are definite worries about how people are going to manage their money in, in later life. Um, and as someone who's been in DC pensions all of my life, I worry. I worry about how I'm going to manage my money. And I'm probably a bit more informed than, than, than many about the options available. So those are kind of some of the big things that have changed. Um, you also said what hasn't changed. And I think the biggest issue for me here is that we still have a largely disengaged population when it comes to saving and, and, and planning for retirement. And um, some of that midlife uh, work that, that Caroline referred to is one of the things that people were hoping that, that would help people, not just with their career path, uh, beyond midlife, but also their retirement planning. Um, and I think that level of engagement or disengagement is unlikely to change. I mean, there've been so many attempts over the whole of my career to try to get people more engaged and, and, and they've almost, almost, almost all failed miserably. Um, so I don't think we should expect it to change. We, what we need is policy that continues to work with the fact that people are, aren't engaged uh, and, and don't want to be. Um, I think the other big thing that's still 
still true, and this is part of the reason for the disengagement, is that pensions and, and retirement savings is still massively complicated, a complex and an alien world for most people. And that also has to be um, reflected in policy. We can't expect people to understand it. Um, thirdly, um, on what hasn't changed, most people are still not saving enough. Um, and that's, that's, again, something it was reassuring to hear the pensions minister say yesterday that the, the 2017 um, auto enrolment review would was high on his list to uh, to implement, uh, and that would mean getting more people saving and ideally getting people to save more. Um, and the other thing that hasn't changed, and it's so easy to forget about this and get carried away with auto enrolment and, and pensions generally, but there are still very large parts of the population who are reliant on the state pension. Um, and that's not just people in retirement now, but we've got huge numbers who are still going to come through who will be massively reliant on the state pension. So we can't forget the importance of the state pension. And I think, you know, with the cost of living crisis, we're just going through now. What's needed going forward is to continue to, to emphasise the importance of the state pension for people and the importance of the triple lock. Uh, and also to support those who are unable to work during those years leading up to state pension age. So that, that I agree, that's, that's, a, that's a big focus um, for, for, for the future policy on ageing. Um, I've got a couple of other things I think that still need attention. Uh, I think this whole issue of drawing down your DC pension massively complex. We need more work done by, I think, more, more by the industry than by government to, to help people with that complexity. Um, we need more guidance from schemes. We may need more advice, maybe through, through employers. But we also need some pathways so that people find it easy to take a regular income rather than thinking, oh, the only thing I can do is take it all out and put, put it in the bank and spend it. Um, so have that emphasis on, on, on drawing a regular income in retirement, I think is important. Annuities still have a role in there. And I think schemes can help people with that as well. Um, I've got a controversial third one, which is I wonder whether it is time, and I know the pensions minister has mentioned this, to open up the debate about public sector pensions again. Um, a lot of people won't like that, but uh, as I say, there is this massive inequality there that I think, um, you know, possibly needs addressing. And the cost, of course, of public sector pensions is a big cost going forward for the younger generation. And, and you know, we need to think this, this through, this intergenerational burden that, that it creates. Um, Fourth thing on what we still need to focus on, 8% is not enough. We need to continue to pressure the government on the 2017 review of auto enrolment. And I think uh, kind of behind all of these things, we need to continue focusing on nudges and defaults and focusing on value um, in pensions so that we don't undermine the great things that have happened in the last few years. So I I kind of summarise by saying we need it to continue to be easy to save. We need it to be easier to save enough for retirement. We need to make it easier to draw an income from your pension. And um, we need to make it easier to help people avoid running out of money in, re in their retirement. And lastly, we need to lock up the scammers. So I'm going to finish on that. <laughs> Brilliant. Th thanks, Jackie. And uh, as you say, you know, the minister yesterday we talked a bit about getting people engaged as well. And I remember when I was at Help the Aged, we had loads of different banks coming to us to offer to give us funding to do another leaflet on managing money. It's like, seriously, we really don't need any more leaflets on this. Um, but actually, it didn't necessarily answer the question. Interestingly, yesterday he was arguing, the minister was arguing that, you know, potentially rainy day saving pots alongside a pension could help with engagement, but of course, potentially undermines the, how much is going into pensions frankly so but maybe that's one to talk about later um let me move on to mario who um ILC and we've worked with them for many, many years and was also involved in the Ready for Aging Alliance. Um, he's going to talk a bit about um, housing and care and care homes. So Mario. 
Uh, thanks very much, David. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some definite themes coming out from what, what people are saying. I, I would definitely um, agree with um, Caroline's point. I think she said that the uh, effectively saying that the language around um, uh, around some of these topics has, has changed. I mean, certainly I've seen government rhetoric changing in terms of um, housing and ageing. Um, numerous policy papers now have seen, have sort of recognised that specialist housing plays a hugely important role in um, preventing the demand for, for higher cost, higher impact social care and NHS provision. And, uh, you know, I remember the first time I sort of, sort of saw this in a in a in a white paper or a policy uh, policy paper, and getting hugely excited and thinking, "Wow, the government have got this! This is fantastic! Policy change is bound to happen." And uh, sadly, that that although the, the language has changed, we haven't seen the the, the, the policy changes that that uh, you know flow through from that that that, that we would have liked, or I, you know, um, we would have liked the the barriers to providing. Um, increasing supply of specialist housing for older people are still there in the, particularly in the planning system um, which is why we haven't seen a radical increase in supply of specialist housing for older people um, over the last 25 years. Um, Knight Frank found that just 7,500 units of specialist older people's housing have been delivered each year over the last decade compared to a potential demand of um, 30,000 uh, and social care funding for care homes has, has only got tighter as well, with its sort of growing concern from councils that um, uh, the proposed reforms are, are underfunded. Um, interesting, perhaps surprisingly, um, the average age of admission into anchors care homes has, has hardly changed, certainly in the last 14 years, which is as, as far back as I could uh, find uh, uh, records for uh, at anchor. This month, the average age of admission was 87 years old. Uh, it's moved around a little bit but that's almost exactly the same as it was back in 2008. Um, what's very very clear though, um, I haven't got stats on this, this is just my experience that I've seen going into care homes, is that the level of frailty in our care homes is, is much much higher than it, than it, than, than, it uh, than it used to be. Um, I was in one of our care homes in Birmingham on um, Monday and uh, it was one of the residents, it was a lot of noise going on, there was a lot of dancing and a lot of sort of um, music going on and one of the residents sort of um, kind of quiet, quietly sort of di disappeared off to her room and I thought oh it's all got a bit much for her and actually she came back wearing tap dancing shoes and started dancing around uh, with everybody else which is actually you know lovely 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 stuff to see but but um, you know that that lady's very much in the minority um, the, the the level of need in in our camps is definitely far higher than it than it used to be which would suggest to me um, given that the age hasn't, uh, age of admission hasn't really changed significantly, that there's a significant increase in 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 our unmet need, um, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure Emily will kind of probably talk about things along along those lines when it, when we when we come across come to her. Um, one thing that um, uh, has changed is interest and awareness among consumers of um, specialist housing. So. 80% of the general public still say that they don't fully understand the options available in terms of specialist housing and care, but 35% um, of over 55 year olds say they'd be very or quite likely to consider specialist older people's housing as an option in later life. Um, so there's a huge amount, there's a sort of growing awareness, growing interest. Um, and that, that's, you know, I think that's, that's really, really positive. I think what uh, in terms of kind of solutions, uh, moving things forward, what needs to change? What one um, sort of piece, piece of research we did recently found that there was this huge disparity between what younger people assume older people want in terms of their housing and care in later life and what older people actually say that they want. So more than half of 18 to 34 year olds um, say that they think their parents will want their family members um, uh, sort of older people will want their family members to look after them in later life but actually a, a, a tiny minority of older people actually say that that's that that is what they want and there's some complex um issues around um feeling of guilt and feelings of responsibility and stuff that that, that kind of play into that um into that discussion and and you know one of the key ways of addressing that we think is kind of creating more of a a conversation so people are able to plan ahead, are able to kind of, it's almost like the last taboo uh, is, is talking about what you might want in, in later life and actually kind of creating a conversation that um, enables that, um, you know, people to voice their views and be listened to, I think uh, is hugely important. And then there's a whole host of steps 
um, that we think could happen to unlock investment in the sector and increase the housing options available to people in uh, in later life. So government have established its task force on older people's housing, which is uh, which is fantastic. But we need to kind of actually see some some that get motoring and actually doing um, you know starting to. To, to make some changes. Um, we'd like to see government ensure that planning reform support the development of older people's housing through a new planning classification for retirement communities. Um, local authorities review their local plans to ensure there's sufficient supply of older people's housing. Homes England to commit 10% of their um, funding to, uh, specifically for retirement housing. Um, and as I say, a, a key part of, of all of that is, uh, is, 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 is causing that conversation to happen, uh, both in terms of people within families or, or, or and, and their kind of loved ones, but also at, at a, um, a national level. It, it does feel like that um, that policy conversation, it felt like we, we gained ground and it feels like that that has fallen back in, in, uh, in recent years. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Mario, really, really good. And um, rather than me sort of rambling again in between them, let's come back to all of those, um, all of those things at the end. And I see there's a couple of questions in the, in, in the chat around getting people to, you know, how do we get people to plan? And, um, um, and there was another one around, um, yeah, the, the, uh, yeah, I think the point around sort of frailty really extra extraordinarily important actually more and more people going into care settings have more and more complex needs than in, in, in the past and and what does that mean? Um, let me um, then pass over to Emily to talk a bit about from her perspective from Carers UK and around sort of care from a sort of um, slightly um, different perspective and we, we've, we've been doing a bit of work around um, sort of the the economic um, uh, contributions that, that older people make and particularly over the last couple of years been focusing a lot on the um, the non-market as well as the market contribution so the, the volunteering and and care as well as the consumption and work and and actually in many ways the the contributions of um, older and indeed younger people as um, in, in terms of um, in terms of these areas is huge and potentially dwarfs the economic the the market costs um, so at that point I'm going to pass over to Emily to um, to give her take Thank you so much, David. And it's been fascinating listening to everyone. And I've really actually enjoyed, partially enjoyed and partially got a bit depressed <laughs> looking back over the last 25 years. And um, I was just uh, just a few reflections because I went I went back to look at uh, Labour Party manifesto, for example, 1997. I went back and thinking about what ILC was thinking in terms of the future and longevity and what wonderful Sally had as her vision um, all those years ago. And it wasn't wrong. And I look back I and mean, if you think 25 years ago, Community Care Act was four years into operation. We're really just learning about the community care, you know, care in the community and the idea that the user could be in control of their services and engaged wasn't really developed. And I think that concept now is very firmly embedded. We can all argue about whether we really think it happens with such a constrained market. I don't think it does in the way that we want it to. But now with personal budgets and direct payments much more um, and choice much more as a as a narrative, if you like, that that does exist. Charges back then were a relatively new thing. And we were arguing over whether, you know, the health bath or baths used to be health. And uh, we were just getting used to the idea that a bath might be social care and having to be paid for. And now, if you look at where that line is now drawn with healthcare, we are paying significantly more for things that were provided free of charge. I think some of our stats and our vision and our predictions were actually really absolutely spot on. When we look at um, the actuarial predictions, healthy life expectancy, we knew about the aging population, we knew about growing need, we knew um, 
we knew all these things. So I looked at a document from 2008 and it said by 2026, the number of people aged 85 uh, will have doubled. Well, that's now, isn't it? And the people with um, profound and multiple disabilities will have increased by 37%. So we knew all of these things. One of the things that people got wrong was uh, propensity to care. And around then the academic discourse was uh, that there would be more women in the labour market and therefore fewer a people able, available and able to care. And what has actually happened is that uh, whilst women's participation in the labour market has increased, they still remain significantly more likely to be um, working part time and caring. And we've seen the amount of caring overall increase, particularly um, well, unpaid, I mean, and particularly at the higher end. So we've seen those people providing 20 hours and especially 50 hours go up over time. And and that, that is a real concern because coming back to you, David, and your economic value and economic contributions, we can monetize that contribution. But what we're doing in monetizing that at times is also looking, missing the opportunity cost that we have there in terms of people's ability to work full time or have more hours work longer in their working lives you know it's one of the reasons why people give up work to care isn't is it isn't it um and then are more likely to be under pensioned women low wage workers much more likely to be providing care um so that we got wrong um i think caroline's point about the uh, short-term decision making i'm just thinking well, why do we why do we never end up with really a truly long-term solution for social care and it it does feel when you look back at historical aspects that the the short-term political cycle is 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 always a, is always a challenge when i go back 25 years ago some of the positive things that have happened i think um uh, one of the things that uh, that was set up was regulation of social care and I've always felt very strongly about this that as a, as a consumer and so many older people and disabled people didn't their consumer rights weren't really a thing if you like and I still think they're slightly behind where they should be in terms of consumer information and consumer rights but that regulation um, has been absolutely critical that we've we've had we've had brought in um the other thing that has uh, around care that's also been developed which i think is positive and landed is loneliness being a thing and that is you know perhaps some of the softer side of care that people really understand that concept do we have enough support to combat loneliness the answer is no but the fact that that is now embedded, I think, is is positive. And now just coming on to a met need in 1997, there was a real reluctance to talk about a met need because of a particular court case um, known as the Gloucestershire judgment. So local authorities really, really worried about measuring unmet need in case that meant they had significant funding responsibilities. So our knowledge of the market, our knowledge of how much people pay privately for care and our measurement of unmet need has been actually quite poor over the last 25 years. And it's organisations like my, my friend and colleague, Caroline Age UK, who've really used stats to the, to, to the max to encourage a, a really, really important look at what unmet need is in the community and of course we're not seeing things go in the right direction it's going in completely the wrong direction our met need is growing spending per head of the population in real terms is is also um lower than it was in 2010 although it grew in real terms from about um 2000 to 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 2010 but even at that point we were still talking about investment in care from the public purse not to keeping pace with uh, with older people's needs 
So I mean, the real something you can you can look at the cash terms and cash terms look they they look quite big and they look like they look positive, but it's not compared to real terms. So in cash terms, there's been a, there's been an increase of about ten billion to about twenty six billion, but as I said, real terms increase really the the increase we've only seen in the last sort of um, 10 years has been in the real terms of increase has only been in the last couple of years. Um, uh, prior to 2010, there was a real terms increase. Uh, and, and some of that is due to due to COVID. So in the last 20, 25 years, we've also had an opportunity that I think has been massively missed over workforce to really understand workforce the importance of this to value this which is largely women's work um which has been traditionally undervalued and i don't think that has changed um to to really to really value it in an equal way with healthcare i think it's interesting that in political documents, social care got quite a good shout in the different manifestos over the years, but not really in the public eye. Now the public is much more aware of social care, but it tends to be because of some of the poor practice and the things we're worried about. Um, so that 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 negative discourse is 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 a challenge, but it's also where we're at. Um, so. I think for me, when we're looking at where we are now and the solutions that we have on the table, I don't I don't I don't feel that we've got we've got the intelligence and we've got the stats. You know, we've got some fantastic knowledge, but we still don't have that longer term solution. We, we have we have again. Um, uh, you know, the dill not principles that can come in 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 2023, which the large majority of consumers probably won't understand because it's so complex um, and it's not really going to bring enough quantum into the system where we're really supporting the overall dealing with workforce and making sure we value them. Um, I did want to end on a bit of a positive and um, and that is that um, sometimes there's a bit of a negative discourse about uh about care like as a society we don't care but in actual fact i think we do and this is where you see much more intergenerational solidarity with younger people supporting grandparents etc and where i think we do care and people demonstrate that every single day uh, at the moment we just during the pandemic we valued it at about 193 billion a year as david said you know that's not even counting the volunteering dwarfing what goes into um care from the public purse. The other thing I think that we've not really maximised is um, technology and assisted living. Uh, and the market has sort of con constrained that a little bit. And that's where I think consumer information has been a bit slow to leapfrog. But off the shelf devices now, I think, are speeding up and in a way are almost getting ahead of public services and where the public's getting ahead of public services and their expectations of digital engagement, for example, is completely different. It, digital engagement with where people are able to use that technology has brought us closer in actual fact to some of our families. It has helped care in a lot of situations. But having said that, we know that there are an enormous number of people who are digitally excluded. So to end on that positive point, um, oh, I've got one more point to make actually, and I'll come back to that. Um, the, the final thing is really around older people care and the um, employment legislation in that we've invested in child care provisions and understood child care, parental leave and those kinds of things. But over the last 25 years, we haven't made that much progress unless it's come from Europe uh, in terms of employment rights for people who are juggling work and care. And that's where we we lag behind other countries and where there could be a real benefit and a bonus in making sure that people are able to take leave. And, and Wendy Chamberlain has got a carer's leave bill, um, which we're we're backing at the moment. She's tenth in the ballot. So please do support. Um, but that's where I think we've missed an opportunity. And that's where I think we need to to need to build. So come back to digital. That's again where I think if we can sort this and make sure that people who are not digitally connected, um, we we really have a lot of potential 
um, to uh, to continue to transform services and consumers experience and make sure that people don't miss out on things. You know, this data sharing is another thing that I think that where where we're missing out, where that has happened for older people in terms of uh, sharing of DWP data with organized, trusted organizations locally, but it doesn't happen for disabled people and it doesn't happen in other areas and people miss out on benefits and entitlements every single day because of it. So lots of potential, absolutely need more funding for hands-on care and that cut sort of to sustain the whole system. Um, I don't feel that, so some things I feel we're in a better place but I, I, I worry, I worry greatly about the additional pressure on families and, um, and the fact that people needing care and not getting the quality of life they need through, um, through not having enough care. Thank you, David. Great, thanks. Um, thanks so much. And I think we may well come back to the tech question later because actually we had a few questions in advance around technology. And I think in terms of the short termism sort of is really interesting for us. And my, the argument I've been sort of testing is that, you know, one of the problems is in the UK, we've been aging over 300 years, but places like Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, perhaps China are going to age very, very rapidly. And, and actually the, 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 the question is whether they will respond much quicker than we have in the UK and um, the US and some of the other, Nor other, Europe other Northern European countries, but um, but maybe my theory is completely wrong. Um, uh, let me uh, finally bring in um, Paul and Kate, and I'm going to bring in Paul Paul first. And these are both the you know the Help the Aged Policy Gang from when I first got into aging. So I'm really really glad glad that they're, they're, they're both here um, to to join us because um, not least because um, it's been so brilliant talking and chatting to them both over 15 years in this space and more than probably more than anyone else will have a really interesting reflections on what actually has changed and Emily's point about loneliness I'm sure both Paul and Kate will talk a little bit about that so Paul am I okay to bring you in first? Sure David thank you very much um, I'd say looking back over the last 25 years I would say there's at least three reasons to be cheerful um, and that is on top of your own coming in to join the age sector movement a while ago. And if anybody wants to express their gratitude to me for bringing David on board, um, please just put an appreciative comment in the chat box. But actually, the things that I would particularly highlight, first of all, just listening to people talking for the last 45 minutes, is the strength of advocacy that we now have. And it is strength and depth because there are whole organizations and movements behind the people who have been speaking. And 25 years ago, I think Sally was one of a small group of champions trying to uh, tell that story. Um, and linked to that, uh, this whole thing about empowerment um, if it's the case that in the beginning was the International Longevity Centre and the ILC was the word, it's also true there was a, a thing which is often forgotten called Better Government for Older People with the Older People's Advisory Group and the movement speaking up for our age with the slogan, nothing about us without us. And that was an extraordinary impetus to the work that's gone on since. Have we managed to mainstream that principle of people uh, having the ability to influence the things that are around them and going to the people as a central place to start? Nothing about us without us. I would say that one indicator, which I picked up this week, was listening to the National Lottery Community Fund just completing its Aging Better program of £80 million of investment, that actually that principle of co-production is really very strong and it's strongly embedded. But as Emily said, I think that a very specific step forward has been the issue of loneliness, which is now 
very much part of the policy framework, coming from a surprisingly low base of awareness and commitment, uh, but building up to a level at which, for example, in 2018, we had the government's loneliness strategy, um, which represents a direction, an opportunity to go forward. And I, of course, uh, I acknowledge that using a single word to describe an emotion cluster that is very complex has its hazards. It can be taken to pathologize or sentimentalize. It can take loneliness out of context because there is always a context to loneliness. It is very often around wider issues of social exclusion. But what we had with this policy step was the ability to take an in the round approach at many different levels to helping people navigate loneliness, whether that would be the personal individual, uh, uh, negotiating their own feelings of loneliness with their psychological approaches, whether it is about what local communities can do to empower or disable, uh, whether it was about the actions of the state at local and national level in making people feel more excluded, more left out, or whether it was just the general climate of awareness. I think on all those different levels, we, we have definitely um, stepped forward and the job now is obviously to develop that and make that a reality um, across the piece. But I, I also wanted, David, if I could, to throw in a couple of challenges um, at any organization calling itself an international longevity center, recognizing that here we have a global, a global network of ILCs. Um, First of all, what perhaps we haven't highlighted is that this longevity thing is an extremely unequal experience. And I see no sign whatsoever that we are really uh, bridging those inequalities. And surely that should be a driving concern of uh, the ILC and many other organizations. And the second thing linked to that, which is, you know, where we do have longevity, what's the point of it? You know, what are we doing to promote that period of our lives and to take forward that thing which was uh, described in the 2014 Care Act as well-being? Um, did, that, did that have any real significance or practical reality? And I think we should look to ensuring that we are talking not only about longevity, but we are talking about longevity, which prizes relationships, uh, contribution, and indeed creativity. The, the, the evidence is abundant that that is, is what we need. And that will be a positive step forward over the next 25 years. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much. Paul and on the international stuff I think what I'll do is a, you know the the and the international work I will bring in um, Ken as soon as, as our first sort of contributor from Age International who we've worked very closely with and of course Sally was always very very passionate about the the global work and it was what inspired her to set up um, ILC. Let me um, pass over to our final sort of contributor um, Kate. Kate let me not ramble and just pass over to you straight away. Thanks David. Um... I, I kind of agreed to um, bring up the end of this and, and then I, as Paul spoke, realised that it's always an error to follow Paul because he says all the things you want to say, but better than you're going to. So anyway, uh, we'll crack on. Um, my span in the ageing world, it doesn't quite stretch 25 years. So forgive me if I kind of, I'm going to talk more about the 20 in which I've worked in, in the ageing space or, or near it. Um, and sort of the first chunk of that was working with um, Paul and David and other brilliant colleagues in what was Help the Aged. And we had, um, in the period up to the point uh, of which I left uh, that organisation, a, br a brilliant time, I think, in um, really um, being engaged in some really interesting, exciting changes um, that were happening 
in the ageing space. You know, there was the, the Turner Commission and the subsequent reforms to pensions. There was driving through legislation on age discrimination. There was things like the introduction of personal budgets. Um, you know, there was a really you know, exciting period in, um, in ageing to be, um, and it's probably why I'm still here, because, uh, you know, it was, it was great time to be sucked into this agenda and to never want to leave. Um, but in the subsequent years, um, I think um, it has been difficult to see the same level of progress. And what I was thinking about is when I left um, Healthy Ages, when, um, when the merger happened, actually, we, we came together and, and set out an agenda. And, you know, I can't remember the exact wording of the report I wrote all those years ago. But I think kind of the top line agenda that we would have had for the key challenges of ageing were well, roughly speaking to make some age, the age discrimination legislation that we'd fought for stick so that we did actually see a, a practical reduction in levels of ageism and age discrimination. To actually improve pension uptake, we'd done some stuff around pension saving, but we really had this ongoing issue with pension credit uptake. It was still a major driver of, of poverty. We had an, a major need to see reform equivalent to that ambitious reform that we'd seen in pensions, but in the area of social care. And we also would have had a strong agenda, and we did have a strong agenda, around dignity for people in the health system, which linked to age discrimination, but was also about how people were treated in the health system. And I think if you kind of design a top line agenda now on ageing, you would still see most of those agenda items on it. And that doesn't feel like a great place to be. We still need to do something to make that age discrimination legislation stick. We still, I mean, in independent age are running a campaign on pension credit uptake and getting pension credit into people's pockets, but it's been exacerbated by a cost of living crisis, which now means people that are not getting those benefits are in dire, dire circumstances. We're still all waiting for reform of social care. We're still, you know, we've never got out the parking lot, as far as I can see, on, on a lot of that. And actually, on top of those issues of dignity in health, we now have significant access issues, which actually was not where the fight was back, back then. Um, but now access is a major, major challenge, and it looks like it's only going to get worse as our NHS is slowly driven into a wall. So, you know, I, I do think um, there are, um, you know, I know it's good to try to be cheerful, but I don't feel very cheerful when I look at that, and particularly the lack of progress on care and on age discrimination, where in some ways we've gone backwards. And actually those two feel very, very linked. They are spiraling problems until we crack ageist attitudes. We will never really, I think, unlock some of the reasons why we don't take care reform as seriously as we should. And I think some of the reasons we've not seen the progress on ageism is because we've had two incredibly kind of divisive periods where we have um, seen a media pit young against old. We've had, we had that with Brexit and I do think that toxicity, as Caroline said, is starting to wane. But actually the, the COVID experience toxified a debate between young and old and set people up against each other in a way that wasn't true or helpful. But I think we, we, you know, we have not made progress on age discrimination and until we make progress on the othering of people who are older, who have disabilities, then we will not be able to crack the, the care debate. Um, so there are things I think where we've gone backwards um, in that period. We, we went forward and we come back. I can't adjudicate exactly whether, whether, whether we're any whether we kept for any of those forward steps. But there are two areas where I want to be a bit more optimistic, and one of them is the one that Paul mentioned. And, and that is the fact that we do see loneliness on the agenda. And I, it's not just about this word loneliness and the fact that we have a government strategy. It's to do with the fact that, you know, when I was working with Healthy Ages, one of the first things I did was work with the government social exclusion unit, which was looking at this multiple deprivation that swirls around people's lives and wanted to apply that to older people. But it was really struggling to know what the metric of good was because the social exclusion agenda in younger people was driven by getting people back into education. That was the norm. And for people of working age, it was about getting people into work. That was the norm we were trying to achieve. And they, we weren't really comfortable with talking about the things that made life good that weren't about production, essentially. And I think what the loneliness agenda is really positive sign of is that we've recognised that there are things that make life good and that are fundamentally the business of society that are not just um, about production, that relationships are critical to uh, well-being, and well-being is really important. So I'm really positive about that progress. It's not just actually progress for older adults, but it's critical to the ageing agenda because actually, um, you know, we haven't got those other things um, necessarily. 
The other thing I think is positive, possibly on a smaller scale, but I think it needs to really be part of where we go in future, is that I think we are doing better at recognising that older people are not one thing. Um, the diversity of the older population. We do much more habitually in ageing spaces talk about um, BAME older people. We talk about um, people, um, LGBTQ plus older people. We talk about people ageing without children. Those are not... Um, unheard of debates in this space probably they need to get out there more but I think it's positive to see that we're having that conversation about the diversity of the older population so the last question was where do we where do we need to go um there's two things that I would like to see I don't know that I have the answers to how we get there although one of them I think anyone who's in this conversation needs to start with it I think we need to have a much more of an us narrative about aging I think we all need to be much more comfortable in saying us when we're talking about older people instead of them and actually um, even if you want to define an age cut off for that a lot of you will be on the us side of it so you know let's be comfortable with talking about the age that we are um, and let's be comfortable with we're talking about older people as us not them um, and actually I think that would get us away from one of the things that I find slightly frustrating which is the why don't they plan for why won't they you know why won't why won't you start with why you won't talk about your later life or plan for your later because actually that's part of your solution right there um, and the other thing I think is we've got to think about a much more positive and inspiring narrative not about later life necessarily but about our whole life course and I do think the hundred year life idea where actually we start to think about the things that we do through our lives and how they phase through and, and we, we go through different parts of our lives where caring is up or caring is down or work is up or work is down or leisure is up or leisure is down. It's almost like a graphic equaliser where the different things are kind of in, you know, kept balanced across our life course. It feels to me like a much more interesting way of, of having the conversation about uh, later life and ageing. Not sure I know how to get there, but that's that's what I'd love to see. And um, I'll shut up there. Thanks. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, Kate. And re really great. And I love the why, why won't we? I, you know, one thing I'm often conscious of is that I absolutely know probably all of us on this call should take a power of attorney. And yet I suspect most of us haven't. Um, you know, we, we tend to think it's for someone else, but, it, you know, we could all have care needs sort of at fairly short term. I think really struck by the whole, oh my, when you think about it, actually, and, you know, I'm sure it was down to help the ages advocacy, but between 2000 and 2002 and 2008 I think we had pension credit introduced social exclusion unit the audit commission driving local authority delivery we had the Turner commission we had the age discrimination legislation we had two aging strategies we have housing and older people frankly if you look at central government now there's a little bit of midlife help midlife MOTs that you, you know there is almost nothing going on compared to what was going on before which is really striking um but but you know I uh, you know be really interesting you know and I might ask the panel to come back around uh, afterwards you know and we're, we, we've not got very long but what's the most urgent uh, or what's the one thing we could we or government uh, let's stick with Kate's we what's the one thing we should be doing um all together um to sort of push this agenda forward and clearly you know it influenced very heavily you know I suspect you know the post 2010 austerity has played a huge part in that lack of ambition um as well as um you know Caroline's point earlier around sort of the the, the short termism that's 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 come in. So let me, um, as an international organisation, um, um, bring in bring in Ken for a moment from Age International, who we, who we work very very closely with, to sort of just give a tiny bit of a sort of a global perspective. So Ken, thanks so much, um, and uh, we'll rush through this. Um, Twenty five years. One of the things that's really happened is actually we've seen um, global population really come to the fore as a mega trend globally. Um, it's not just about aging in, in wealthier countries. We're seeing that the majority of the world's older people are in low middle income countries. We're seeing that actually the need for addressing population aging is on the agenda of governments worldwide. But also, I think in a really positive way, this is actually shifted and is in, be increasingly becoming embedded into the discourse and at a multinational level, multilateral, uh, UN level, but but in other spaces as well. Um, throughout that time, you know, one of the things this 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 shift to kind of global population aging, and one of the things that we're also seeing is a lot of shifts though in socioeconomic dynamics. So the kinds of things that um, we would tend to expect to be in place that would support or help older people in 
um, in, in, in traditional contexts, you know, are no longer in place. And so there is a gap that has developed where neither the state nor the family are actually filling those needs. And the, the, the experience of, of aging and the desires of older people in, in many of the contexts in, in, you know, ar around the globe are exactly the, the, the things that they're reflecting on are exactly the things that we've just been talking about. The need for better health, the need for having um, engagement in the community, the um, better income, housing, um, addressing mental health and loneliness, all of these things are universal experiences. Um, interestingly, you know, 25 years in that period of time, one of the things that we saw happen was the creation of the first real um, global action plan on aging, the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging, just celebrated its 20th anniversary. And in that period of time, we've seen that global action plan become completely irrelevant um, for this government anyway in the UK. Um, it's still very vibrant and active for, for other governments, um, but it's really waning in terms of being this, uh, this, 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 this driving force that, that guides policy and thinking about how to um, address the issues facing older people. Um, thankfully, there are other things that are starting to step in to fill its space. Um, I think, um, you know, so you're seeing the UN step up in other ways and you've had the WHO um, take a number of steps which have been very positive. There's a, they did this fantastic world report on um, um, aging and health. Um, they did a, very recently a, a world report on ageism. They created a UN decade of healthy aging. Um, we've seen, you know, again, the WHO championing this thing called um, age-friendly environments, age-friendly cities. All these things have been contributing factors to helping um, governments, including this government and localities, municipalities. You've seen, you know, um, Manchester benefit from the age-friendly communities approach as well. Um, I'm very pleased to say that in that 20 years, that there, there's also been uh, 25 years, we've seen a huge shift actually in, in terms of how the UK government has approached its thinking of what it does internationally as well. And we now have um, aging slowly being embedded into the approach and the policies written into strategy documents of the FCDO, um, still have a long way to go um, to, to really make it an active part of how the government approaches what it does, but, um, you know, it, 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 it has seen a huge transformation. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think this, that we should be thinking about um, actively, not just, you know, internationally, but obviously here in the UK as well, is data. And again, the government has played a very important role at creating a this a, a, a city group on aging in terms of the U, UN statistical agencies, which is going to hopefully create the tools that allow better disaggregated data on age to both be gathered and analyzed in a way which is comparable across, you know, uh, different different international contexts. You know, for all, all of us in this room, we're all you know policy geeks, and so we can talk about these things happily. We know that this is going to have a huge transformation on the ability of governments and the international community to act if we don't actually see that diversity that Kate was talking about, about aging and capture that diversity, it's impossible to build the policies around that. But finally, I wanted to say that um, one of the things that sadly has changed and, and or maybe hasn't changed, but we're just it's much more visible to us, is that there is a systemic discrimination and ageist attitudes against older people globally. And one of the things that I think uh, in terms of that way forward, um, you know, we really do need to see an urgent reframing of attitudes and approaches in a way that is universal, that allows um, you know, all governments to basically take that step forward and say, actually, you know, we, we, we respect the rights, we recognize the rights of older people, we need to be thinking about older people as equal citizens in society. And one of the transformations we've also seen in this period of time is that there's a move afoot to create a, a UN Convention on the Rights of Older Persons, which is building momentum. And again, I think it's a positive thing to say that the UK government over a number of years has been a supporter of that. I'll leave it there. 
Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Ken. Um, I'm very conscious we've sort of, I've already sort of badly chaired and we've got, we've gone over, but I'm going to keep going for a bit just so we've actually heard a few other voices. So if anyone wants to actually um, say anything for a minute, could you just put your, um, your wave your, wave your hand or wave your virtual hand better, um, which is, should be under reactions. Um, if not, I'm going to go and get. So I'm going to come back to colleagues. But there, if if there's any sort of thoughts in terms of what people have said, that would be. Um, no, it's very unusual for us not to have lots of questions. Um, okay, um, let me then very quickly, and I'm going to give our panel sort of 30 seconds or so, so each to sort of um, reflect. Most urgent challenge. What's the one thing we need to do to in terms of in, in terms of Kate's challenge, and let me start with with Caroline. Caroline, oh, it's kind of an impossible question, really, David. I mean, I've really enjoyed listening to what everyone's got to say, and maybe I, I and maybe overall, I think I was perhaps a little bit more gloomy than I needed to be. Um, I think, in terms of where we are now, just because I've been thinking about it quite a lot just today, I think more to assert older people's rights in this country, particularly those at greatest risk of being left behind, I think would be quite timely. Um, obviously, the Bill of Rights is a, is a hook for being able to do that at one level, not because it helps, but because it doesn't, uh, or at least because it doesn't really address any of the issues that we saw emerge during the pandemic, or that sort of got put in lights during the pandemic. And also, you know, just really conscious that every day there's another story about um, older people who are not online in this country being excluded from being able to do everyday things like manage their money or book an appointment or whatever it might be. So I think I think the time it's there's quite a good time now to start being a bit more kind of upfront really about how unfair some of what's going on at the moment is for older people. And perhaps to link that with more support for a UN convention and various other rights-based approaches. But if you ask me tomorrow I might say something different. Great, brilliant. Thanks, Caroline. Jackie? Um, yeah, uh, much the same, really. Um, I, I, I guess I'd, I'd add sorting out social care and, and not so much the, the, well, the funding is obviously part of it, but but also the, um, the employment aspects and uh, uh, just, just giving it, uh, you know, another emphasis in the policy landscape seems, seems to be quite key at the moment. Um, I don't think that there are any pensions issues that I'd say usurp that, although <clears throat> the thing that uh, Kate mentioned about pension credit is also is, is clearly important. So I'm, I'm just going to keep it short like that. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, thanks, Jackie. Um, Mario? I'm going to attempt to be equally succinct. Um, the, the big thing for me is is the, the growing diversity of, of older people. And, you know, so I talked about the, the increasing frailty in our care homes, but equally uh, some of the oldest residents we provide services to are in our housing and, and um, living very active, independent lives and embracing all the well-being services and stuff that, that, that we offer. Um, so something about how we... Um, uh, I, I think, you know, champion older people's rights, challenge this, as I saw in one of the comments from, um, I think Jane Minter sort of posted the comment about kind of challenging the, 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 the deficit view of ageing um, and doing more to sort of acknowledge the, the, the positives that, that come with an ageing society. Sorry, I didn't do a very good job of being succinct, but, um, but that's the, that, that, those are the thoughts I'm left with at the moment. That's fine, Mario. Thank, thank you very much. I'm really, really great um um to have you here emily i'm biased about care so i think funding care better and looking after the social care workforce and sorting better rights for unpaid carers would just transform things help our economy help business you know in the framework of rights that that caroline's talking about where people have a right to things and a good life and a good life throughout all their life um, it's really essential. I wanted to go from something that is, can be gut-wrenchingly terrible to look in people's lives and see what they have to put up with to being, I'd like it to be totally brilliant. <laughs> Great, Th thanks so much, Emily. And then um, Paul? So uh, policy environment looks pretty 
bleak, pretty arid. And I think realistically, we have to go with the things that are there, the opportunities that are in front of us. Social prescribing is a show in town. Let's make it more than just a bit of the machinery, a kind of administrative cog in the NHS. Let's make it a real instrument uh, for enhancing lives. Brilliant, thank you very much. And then finally, Kate. I'm just gonna do what campaigners do and yeah. say the same thing I said before, which is I genuinely think, um, and I absolutely agree with Emily, if you look at this in policy issues, care is absolutely urgent, but I think we can't, we can't crack that until we start to really shift thinking about older as and part of that is about being ours, not them. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Kate. I am conscious it's five o'clock and people want to go and have their tea or, or um, but I'm really, really grateful for all of you for joining. You'll seen in the chat we have, um, we're doing a bit of a survey on people's reflections of what's changed over the last 25 years and be really keen to have as many thoughts as you want. We've had, um, you know, some really interesting things about the, the end of cassette tapes and things like that, that sort of, you know, really, really um, definitely interesting for you all to have a look at. Um, we've got our future of Aging Conference on the 24th of November in terms um, so hope to see some of you there and we'll be continuing to do work around the 25th anniversary we've got I should say um, we've got a really really lovely video uh, interview that we filmed with Sally about a month ago and we plan to sort of broadcast that on YouTube at some point over the next few weeks and I, I hope that lots of people can join us at the same time to watch it together and um, and share their thoughts whilst we're watching it it's a really really lovely um, um, about sort of you know her life and ILC and her ex you know work with Age Concern at the time as well Age UK now um, so I hope you'll join us for that and the other the next event we're, we're doing is we've got an event in Japan um, in about two weeks time in the embassy over there and we'll clearly provide you with a virtual link I'm supposed to be going but clearly that involves me passing a COVID test at some point in the next seven days which may well mean I'm not going but um, but we'll see but thank you all for joining us and um, I look forward to seeing you again so thank you